Uh, today, we're going to talk about seismic design. Um, I'll give an overview of the, the, the process, um, help you understand what, what questions you need answered, where to get started, um, and, how, and how to think about uh, going about designing a structure for seismic demand. I'll talk about uh, a recent bridge I designed uh, for seismic, and uh, then I'll take some questions. Um, if I can't answer your question, um, you can send the send the question to uh, Midas, and they'll get it to me, and I'll, I'll get you an answer. If I don't know the answer, I'm not going to not going to give you a bogus answer. So we'll we'll get we'll get to uh, the, the heart of it. Um, here's uh, some common references used. I'll start on the right. The ASHTO guide specifications for seismic bridge design. This is a really comprehensive reference. Um, it's used nationally and internationally. In seismic regions are written largely by Roy Emson. Um, Roy's a longtime engineer um, at, and had his own company for a long time. He actually is working for Michael Baker now. Um, the other reference there on the right, seismic design and retrofit of bridges, is kind of like the, the seismic design bible. Um, it's a fantastic book, uh, easy read, lots of information in there, good stuff um, with respect to uh, displacement-based design and overall seismic philosophy, and then even down in the nitty-gritty details, um, you know, selecting your uh, your boundary conditions and and, and modeling um, guidance and lots of good stuff. Detailed guidance um, for detailing your your connections. In the center is uh, the bread and butter of of what we do out here. It's Caltrans Science and Design Criteria. Caltrans has really led the way over the years in, in providing uh, seismic guidance. Um, ever since the 1971 San Fernando earthquake, they've been providing seismic guidance. It was 18 years later uh, when Loma Prieta hit that FHWA finally adopted uh, some seismic guidance from ATC-6. ATC-6 was largely based on uh, the Caltrans initial guidance. Um, and since 1999, they've been producing uh, the seismic design criteria, which is a fantastic document. They just came out with version 2.0 last year, um, and they're they're constantly updating their guidance. They have an over the Office of Earthquake Engineering at Caltrans has more than a three million dollar annual budget for research alone. Um, so they are always looking into ways to improve our seismic design. Obviously, earthquakes are uh, a big hazard out here. And then there's uh, individual DOT guidance from whatever whatever state you're in. Um, they're all uh, largely similar as all displacement based design, capacity design um, with minor nuanced variances depending on uh, the given state, um, but uh, all very good. And I've, I've worked in uh, Alaska on some seismic designs as well as uh, Utah on seismic design and, and both uh, references are good. And there's others that I'm, that I'm leaving out. Uh, lots of DOTs do a good job, just happens to California is huge. They've got a lot of tax money, and uh, Caltrans is really big, and they can put a lot of engineers uh, to work on this stuff. So first, uh, the 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 bridge you're designing, the the owner is going to set the, the category for that bridge, and that category will determine the uh, severity of the earthquake, the design earthquake you're going to be designing to, and then the expectations of the performance of that bridge. So. Uh, the safety evaluation earthquake for an ordinary bridge um, corresponds basically to a 75-year bridge lifespan. So most of our bridges are meet that 75-year lifespan. And the expectation is that that bridge will not collapse, but it will likely need replaced. And then uh, as you work up in category and work up in uh, expected performance, um, it becomes more expensive. You're going to get a, a better structure uh, resiliency. Um, you, you might need to use base isolation in some cases if, if you're having to design for an essentially elastic structure. But the categories are based on the route largely and um, you know, if you need emergency vehicles to be able to access something, um, then that, that bridge can't afford to be out of service, then uh, the, the agency will set uh, a higher category. Uh, inside the design, your structure will have uh, three main types of, of elements, uh, capacity protected elements, sacrificial elements, and earthquake resisting elements. Your capacity protected elements are those that we want to 
uh, prevent from experiencing any elastic deformation. Um, so in in school, um, you, you typically buildings are taught, building design is taught. Uh, the, the building industry is much larger than our industry. Um, and you've heard strong column, weak beam. In, in bridges, it's the opposite. It's basically strong beam, weak column. Uh, we, we take all of our inelastic deformation in the columns and we want to keep the superstructure for the beam uh, essentially elastic so that uh, cars can travel over it. And cars don't get damaged during, uh, during uh, an earthquake. Um, and then our uh, earthquake resisting element would be the columns typically. And those columns are expected to deform ductally meaning that they can deform beyond the, uh, the yield limit state some distance. And then the, there are uh, ductility limits for an individual column and duct global ductility limits for the overall structure that have to be uh, met uh, based on the criteria that you're designing to. Um, and then there's sacrificial elements, um, which are typically the shear keys. Um, in California, we're talking about a, a seat type abutment then the shear keys are going to be at the abutments. They'll be the, the back wall which, of the abutment, which is designed to, to shear off and compress the, passively the soil behind the abutment. And then shear keys uh, on the sides of the abutment that, that prevent uh, transverse movement. And those shear keys are designed to shear off in the design earthquake. And anything smaller than that, um, including, you know, especially for a skewed bridge that might want to rock off the seat, just Simply in temperature fluctuations over the years, um, or in smaller earthquakes, keep that keep that bridge in where you want it to be, and uh, it's strong enough to do that, and then um, weak enough to shear off in, the, in a major earthquake, so that the the bridge can ride on the seat freely. Um, the uh, the earthquake resisting elements I talked about ductility, but uh, the, some other seismic um, considerations are expected material properties. So where you might have a 60 KSI rebar, um, if you've ever looked at a mill certificate for, for that rebar, you'll see that the, the minimum of all the tests performed on the rebar is gonna be greater than 60. And the average is, is somewhere higher than that. So uh, in seismic design, we wanna be a little more precise and ensure that the, uh, the structure is actually gonna yield and if we say that it's 60 KSI and it doesn't yield, that's because it's not actually 60 KSI, it's more like 68 KSI. So we design for expected material properties. We also design for effective section properties. Um, once a, say a column section has, uh, it has a certain moment of inertia um, when it's intense, but after it's the concrete on the exterior the cover concrete is spalled, um, steel starts to yield, um, that concrete develops cracks, um, and now you don't have a complete section. So your your uh, moment of inertia has been reduced. So uh, we want to take that into consideration to determine your your ultimate uh, dis displacement demand on that on that column um, and the ductility of that column. Um, so we are reducing uh, the, the 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 section properties uh, for certain for certain sections, and there's good information out there for how to do that pretty easily there's some, there's some charts available but then uh, to do it more uh, or to determine those section properties more accurately is an iterative process as uh, as a bridge is is rocking transversely if you've got a row of columns uh, they're they're under different axial loads throughout and axial loads impacts capacity and um, and uh, it's going to alter your your effective section uh, your effective section so it's an iterative process that you'll need to do. And lastly, we need to consider uh, foundation flexibility. So if you don't consider foundation flexibility, um, then you're assuming that all of the displacement is occurring as a result of rotation within the column. And you might be over assuming the, the rotation in that column and, and the, then uh, determining that you've got adequate ductility when in reality, maybe a lot of that displacement is happening underground. Um, so we need to consider that the, the foundations are not completely rigid and be able to work that into your, your model. Lastly, um, and probably most importantly, is uh, developing your plastic hinge. So the plastic hinge is the concept of uh, localized um, inelastic rotation within, uh, within a localized 
segment of your uh, earthquake resisting element. Um, there's also uh, multiple ways for determining uh, the properties of that plastic hinge. Midas, Midas does a good job of it. And you can see here um, the difference between uh, your, your yield displacement and then all the displacement that's occurring as a result of the, or all the curvature that's occurring as a result of the, uh, the, the localized plastic hinge. And detail-wise, you can, you can tell by looking at a rebar cage if uh, something has likely been detailed to, to have a plastic hinge because the transverse hoops or um, the transverse steel has, or confining steel is uh, much more tightly spaced or maybe larger diameter than the remainder of the uh, confinement steel throughout the section. Um, talking about the analyses, there's, there's analyses for determining demand. Uh, there's also analyses for determining um, capacity. And there's multiple types of analyses that you can run to, for each, uh, for each uh, component that you're trying to determine. And those analyses start with basic. Maybe you'll run at a 30% level design. You just want to get a sense for what size your, your columns need to be. You run a basic demand analysis and equivalent static analysis, uh, which is a single degree of freedom um, lump mass oscillator. Um, and then as you step up in, in uh, complexity, you're also stepping up in efficacy. Uh, so the, the next highest level would be an elastic dynamic analysis, commonly uh, a response spectrum analysis is run. Um, that acceleration response spectrum is provided by uh, your geotechnical engineer typically, but they're drawing that from uh, likely from USGS uh, hazard maps um, to, and then, and then uh, gearing it towards your locality. Um, so running a response spectrum analysis is a is the combination of a, a modal analysis and an eigenvalue analysis. So you're getting the fundamental uh, period of your vibration period of your structure, and then uh, placing that period within a response spectrum to grab an acceleration, and then you're turning that acceleration into uh, a usable uh, variable, um, usually displacement, and um, the response spectrum analysis, spectrum analysis is typically run in orthogonal directions. So, and then you uh, you want to combine those to get a, a maximum displacement. Um, and we use the complete quadratic combination three. Um, it's it's easy to do when you click a button in Midas. Uh, you know, there's other things you can use like square root some of the squares, um, but it's been determined and and you can determine for yourself. Um, that the CQC3 is, uh, is the best way to combine to get the most accurate results. Um, and then lastly, there's the nonlinear time history analysis. Um, useful for complex bridges is what we used on uh, the Panama Bridge, um, but should also be, it's actually required to be checked by Caltrans um, against a simpler method because um, even though you're getting a lot of data points, you know, every time step you're getting a data point. Um, if it's a poor model, or you know, it's, you don't understand the complexity that's going into it. You're, you're not going to get a, a good result. It's going to be a super precise result, but it's it doesn't mean it's accurate. Um, but the nonlinear time history analysis, when performed uh, correctly, is a very powerful tool. Um, and you can see here the uh, restrictions on the various analysis methods set by Caltrans. One thing I want to point out, because most of the bridges you you use, you're going to be using a, or you design, you're going to be using a response spectral analysis is to be careful not to uh, not to allow yourself to be tempted to pull forces from that uh, from the results of that analysis. The only viable uh, result of that analysis is a displacement. Um, so for on the capacity to decide uh, capacity side, we have uh, uh, I think the 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 easiest and the, the most uh, Commonly used um, type of model would be your pushover model. That's the inelastic static analysis. Um, you're 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 applying a, a displacement at the center of gravity of your structure. So for a two-span structure, I'm applying that displacement at a node at the center of my uh, my bent cap, and then um, pushing the bridge incrementally and watching the uh, the plastic hinges yield 
and then deform and then ultimately fail and then when enough fail you get collapse so you're seeing the the real performance of your structure at various displacements and then you can compare that to uh, the demand that you get from your response spectrum analysis to determine where where exactly you sit and maybe what needs shifted in your design um, it's really powerful and really uh, convenient in, uh, to use in Midas. Um, it's color coded. The, the hinges turn blue when they uh, when they yield, and uh, you can see what the displacement is for each one when it yields. And again, it's a it's an iterative process as you're altering uh, any aspect of the design. Then the uh, the axial loads on each column get altered, and then you got to alter the uh, the effective section properties and maybe then you have to alter your plastic hinge properties and it kind of goes in a circle until you um, until you reach convergence there's also a local displacement capacity um, analysis uh, that's a simplified um, capacity analysis that you can use where you're using the uh, elastic static analysis to determine demand um, then there's your moment curvature analysis to get individual section capacities we all, we all know about that I'm sure um, and then lastly, the ductility analysis, which is really a comparison. So uh, with Caltrans, we wanna, we're, we're searching for our local ductility or the ductility that an individual earthquake resisting element possesses to have a minimum of three, meaning it can displace three times its yield displacement without failing. Um, but then globally, we wanna rein in the drift so that we're not, uh, the bridge isn't shaking too much so they limit global displacement um, based on uh, the type of bridge and some other factors, but um, typically it's somewhere around five. Um, so I'll talk about uh, a bridge I designed recently. Uh, this is the I-10 Express Lanes Design Build Project. This is in San Bernardino County, California. It's uh, 20 lane miles of uh, express lanes that are going in. Um, construction started recently. Um, and it's about a billion dollar project. Um, my, my role in, on the project was to design one of the two overcrossings that Michael Baker was responsible for. We were partnered with Jacobs that had the other half of the, uh, the bridges. And um, um, I also uh, provide construction support for, for Michael Baker's side of the project. Uh, the, the unique aspect of this bridge design was the bent connection. Um, getting this approved through type selection um, was the challenge and uh, one of the exciting aspects of uh, being an engineer is an opportunity to get to do something new. Um, so excited to see this go in and um, construction is coming up soon and de demolishing the existing bridge coming up here in uh, end of October. So uh, Midas also asked me to discuss some of the, uh, the challenges um, of the different types of bridge projects that we see. Um, you know, I haven't designed 100 bridges, so this is my experience. And any given type of project is going to have its own challenges that may exceed those of another type of project that you might think wouldn't. But um, you know, in general, I would say these are the challenges that I think um, you experience. Uh, and different project types. You basically have bridge replacements, uh, bridge widenings, and new bridges, meaning a bridge on an alignment where there isn't currently a bridge. Uh, the, the challenges here, uh, Vineyard is a, is a, that I'm going to talk about is a bridge replacement. So the challenges are um, being able to meet the existing roadway alignments and SKUs. Uh, so it's hard to vary too far from, from what's out there right now. Uh, the main challenge, uh, especially in conceptual design, is the construction and, and demolition staging, where you have to maintain uh, traffic on, on the bridge at all times. So you're demolishing half of a bridge, ensuring that the other half is going to be stable and be able to handle the, the traffic that you're putting on it, and uh, putting up barriers uh, to make it safe, and also allowing for pedestrian crossing while you're building the, the new half of the bridge also has to be stable as half of a bridge um, and then shifting traffic over to that new half demolishing the other half of the old bridge building the new half of the other bridge and then connecting with the closure pour um, all the while maintaining uh, safe traffic and um, pedestrian traffic 
Um, you want to minimize your potential for costly overbuilds. Um, if you're on the same alignment and you need to have so much traffic on the bridge, sometimes you, you can't fit that traffic on the half of the bridge minus the uh, minus the closure port. So then you need to overbuild, and where you might see a 25 foot shoulder on a bridge somewhere, and you wonder why, you know, why why is this such a huge shoulder here? Um, probably because of the construction process. So um, you want to try and minimize that, um, which is a game basically, and and trying to put the puzzle together. Um, it's fun coming up with ideas to to figure that out at the beginning, though. Um, make sure that there's space for the workers to work and for the construction equipment to be out there where it needs to be. So you have to have a sense for how it's going to be built um, to, to make sure you have a good gap between the existing and, and the new structure as it's being built. And then utilities can be a problem too, especially if there's a, a big water line that needs to maintain its um, maintain running and it might determine um, how you're going to de demolish the existing bridge or how much of the bridge you can demolish before you transfer to a new water line. You don't want to have multiple utility transfers or costly extra utility bridges that are temporary. Um, so those are some bridge replacement challenges. Um, and then bridge widening has their own, its own set of challenges. Um, you've got, especially with seismic, you've got an existing structure that may uh, not meet the, the current code um but you have to design a widening that meets the current code that existing structure has its own fundamental period so you have to analyze that to determine how it's going to move in an earthquake your your widened structure uh you don't want it to be in conflict with that uh you want it to flow as one structure when it's when it's complete so you want to design it to match the behavior of the existing structure but to have all the modern code requirements met uh, so it may be that you then have to retrofit the existing bridge or um, determine that the, the widened structure can uh, take all of the demand for the modern earthquake and eliminate the requirements, some of those requirements for the existing structure. But there's some challenges there for sure. Um, again, space to work as you're building next to an existing existing bridge. Um, and then the new the new bridge, I think, has the greatest freedom of uh, alternative options and the fewest constraints by comparison. Not to say that there aren't constraints. There's certainly constraints with every with every uh, infrastructure project, um, but you're not dealing with existing traffic um, maintenance, uh, which is the main issue when you're building a new bridge. Um, so I think it makes things a little bit easier, gives you more options. Uh, so I'll say that. In each project, regardless of, of bridge type, you've got unique set of challenges. Um, and in my limited experience, uh, what I have found, and I haven't always thought this way, um, but the more uh, the more work I perform in this industry, the more it seems very evident to me that the essential foundation of a successful project is team cohesiveness. Um, a working culture of open, respectful communication within and between coordinating subdisciplines can save time and cost, can quickly uncover and correct mistakes or oversights, and grow each engineer's broader knowledge base. Uh, I found that uh, communication is the key, and being able to effectively effectively communicate technical um, issues to different subdisciplines, which in the civil project there are you know 15 different subdisciplines working on a given project. Um, they all have their own sets of issues. You know, we have our sets of, of issues that we want to resolve. Sometimes those issues are conflicting. Well, who has to make a change? Is it me or you? Um, and it's almost like being a lawyer. You, you know, you, you got to make sure that you are um, uh, respectfully conveying your, your issue and trying to come to a mutual agreement of uh, what's going to be changed. For example, even the most minor thing, um, somebody's working on sign signage. Um, I've got two bridge mounted signs on my bridge and they alter the location of that sign or the size of that sign. And I've designed the, the connection of the, you know, the frame and the connection to the bridge and it has its own set of demands and then the bridge has to resist it and that exterior girder has to resist it. They make a change and don't communicate it to me. Um, and then I, I print my plans and see that there's a sign in a place where it's not supposed to be or change sizes or something. And now I'm wondering, uh-oh, what, what happened? So that could have been solved right from the start. 
by a simple phone call or an email, hey, I need to change this, this is why. Okay, now I know what I have to do. Uh, when you don't do that, then it causes delays and potential problems. And if you're not uh, communicating with people, obviously it's, it can be upsetting. So that's my soapbox. So here's Vineyard. It's a two span, 222 foot, eight inch uh, long bridge, 110 feet, 10 inch wide. It's uh, precast girders, precast pre stressed, and actually all pre tensioned concrete girder bridge. Um, seemingly a normal, boring highway bridge, um, but uh, I can say that it was certainly not boring. Um, and I don't know what normal is, it's, they seem to all have. Uh, their their challenges, but uh, uh, certainly not certainly not boring and and not lacking in its in its challenges. And it's really fun to to design. Um, so here's some of the some of the issues. Um, like I was talking about trying to limit overbuild. You can see this dashed portion is the existing bridge, and the new bridge is wider. Uh, part of that is because uh, we needed it to be wider for overbuild um, to be able to fit traffic on the existing bridge so i had to scoot my bridge out of the alignment um, but there's a sidewalks on both sides um, so instead of overbuilding by six and a half feet to accommodate the sidewalk i eliminated the, the sidewalks in the temporary condition and designed temporary catwalks um, that met uh, ada requirements to be bolted onto the existing bridge uh, when it was in that when it was in the demolished condition the half demolished condition and then attach to the new bridge so that I could use that entire space to fit my temporary traffic lanes on. And then the, the last stage of construction is going putting those sidewalks in, uh, which had to be doweled in rather than uh, cast in place. So a, a little bit of a change from, uh, from a standard plan, but worth it to minimize overbuilt. Um, you can see here the, the, the temporary catwalks here on the existing and on the, on the new side. So that's one challenge to overcome. Um, then we have uh, just the geometry of the bridge. Uh, all three supports have different skews. It's passing over uh, part of the I-10 that's that curves. Um, so although they have different skews designed all along the same bearings, make it a little bit easier for the contractor and easier for design. Um, but there's complex horizontal curves. Complex curves meaning that there are multiple curves within the same line. Um, so uh, that led to the necessity of variable girder lengths and skews and variable width overhangs. Because I'm using precast girders, I've got straight girders, but I have a curved alignment that's not a consistent curve and multiple spans. So those individual uh, girders are skewed a little bit differently. They're a little bit different in length, um, all to meet, make sure that I meet the the uh, limitations of the allowable overhang width. Um, I tried to group them as best as I could. Uh, they ended up being that the four uh, corner girders are, are different lengths and skews, and that uh, most of the interior girders on that particular quadrant are the same, uh, with the exception of the, the exterior girders during the temporary condition, which is right there near the near the closure port. So another weird challenge. Um, then because of that, because all of my girders are not aligned, um, then I was concerned about making that seismic vent connection with post-tensioning. Now our post-tensioning has got to feed through a strange alignment, um, and I didn't want to do that. So I wanted to find a way where I could make that vent connection um, with pre-tensioning strands. Uh, and I'll get to that. Another challenge, um, there's an 18 inch water line running through the structure and uh, the, the structure exists at the high point of a, of a vertical curve. And if you've been involved with uh, water utility designs, you know that at the peak, you need an air release valve where <clears throat> air kind of collects up there. Uh, that peak happened to happen within the first span of my bridge um, over the uh, traveling lanes beneath. So not on the shoulder, not at the bent where I could easily run a gutter down. And because they're uh, precast pretension girders, they can't punch through those girders with, uh, with a pipe to get out to the sidewalk to put a, a manhole where you can access the air release valve. So we had to put a manhole right in the roadway there between the two girders, uh, right where the release valve was. 
Um, and then just, it's a coordination piece like everything else in these civil projects, um, coordinating with the uh, utilities engineers, coordinating with the city who owns the, the utility, coordinating with uh, the state who owns the bridge underneath that utility, um, and ensuring that we had a solution that met everybody's requirements. And because we're in seismic, we're using these flex 10 couplers that are uh, basically 360 degree ball joints to allow uh, the, the, the bridge to move and the pipe to uh, remain unstressed. So within, uh, here's the bent connection. Within these girders, I've got 62 total strands per girder. Uh, 14 of them are harps, and that's the standard shape you see over here on the left. The most harp strands you can fit in there are 14, and that's that's these harps is, is this shape right here. So having the harp strands in there helps with uh, helps with shear uh, capacity at the end, and it's putting the uh, the moment capacity in the in the girder where the moment demand exists. Um, then I have 26 continuously stressed strands running through the bottom flange. That's the black dots here. And then I, I had to add 22 additional strands to each uh, girder to make this bent connection. So the, the way that <clears throat> the way that I did the connection was I um, I looked at uh, some Caltrans research. They had two rounds of research over the years: uh, initial research at UC San Diego, and follow-on research at Iowa State that looked at um, seismic bent connections using pre-stressed strands and the different configurations of the strands uh, embedded into the bent. Um, but they looked at it for um, eye girders. And this is done for eye girders. There's, there are connections made with pre-stressing strands just like this with eye girders. But, but uh, as far as I know, it's not been done with, um, with wide flange girders. And the wide flange girder has significant, uh, significant capacity and has to resist uh, a very large load at that connection. <clears throat> and another concept of seismic design is that of overstrength load. <clears throat> Excuse me. The overstrength is um, you're looking at the moment capacity of the earthquake resisting element, the column here. At the top of the column, you have a certain moment capacity, and uh, the connection, capacity of that connection then has to be. Uh, typically 1.2 times that uh, that moment capacity of the column to ensure overstrength. Um, so all of these strands of the connection have to make have to uh, be able to provide that overstrength capacity. The way the connection works is uh, there's two components to the connection. There there's the um, the diaphragms uh, that abut the the bent cap, which is this. Um, and these diaphragms uh, pass between each girder, and they have dowels, number 10 dowels, passing through the girder, and those dowels serve as a, a clamping mechanism that, uh, that clamp the diaphragm to the, to the girder. And then that, that diaphragm concrete is um, bonded in, somewhat to the, to the girder, and it provides some, some skin friction. So you're looking at, um, you're, you're looking at interface shear capacity uh, and that's the first uh, the first mechanism that gets engaged in in this connection and then uh, beyond that you have the the moment connection at the bottom that's the positive moment and that's provided by the strands that pass through the the bank cap and then loop up to the top here and then uh, the negative moment capacity is provided by your typical um, <clears throat> So you've got uh, some some usually larger bars passing over the bent cap that extend maybe a third into the a third of the span like that into each span to provide that negative moment capacity. <clears throat> the columns um, are fixed at the at the bent and pinned at the uh, at the foundation. Um, so it's your choice in design uh, how you want to set this up. You have to have some fixity to be able to uh, provide that seismic resistance and, and force a plastic hinge to form. If you have both ends fixed, if you have the, the if you have a fixity at the at the column base, um, you're going to have to have a much larger foundation because that foundation also has to be capacity protected. So in pinning the base, uh, though, you're going to get larger displacement. 
So it's a, it's a, it's a, I tried both actually. It's a feel for trying to make sure I get that ductility um, and limit the, the overall displacement while also um, uh, minimizing the, the size of the, of the foundation. Um, and in modeling, the pin, which is modeled, which is shown here, the actual design detail of a pin is just a, a narrow diameter uh, rebar cage um, that extends into the footing. And then we've got some of the concrete removed down here and some expansion joint material put in there to allow for the, allow for the rocking of the column. Um, so, but that narrow diameter, albeit narrow, still provides some moment capacity, something like 20% of your plastic moment capacity comes out of there. So consider whether or not you wanna use this or, or some of it in your design, depending on how, uh, how your seismic comparisons uh, play out. Um, or whether you want to model as a, a, a freely rotating pin. Uh, it may be that you want to do, uh, do one in one instance and another in another instance, depending on what you're trying to achieve in your particular analysis. Um, and you can see here the top of the column is, uh, this is the only part of the column that passes through into the bank cap. This other part of the column, the flare is isolated. It's just architectural, which, which bothers me because I like, you know, formal, uh, form follows function, um, but uh, the way I, I justify this to myself, I don't think it looks any better than just us having a straight column, but um, the way I justify it to myself is that that is dead weight to the column, so it's providing, you know, more axial load and giving that column a little bonus capacity with that axial load. Um, and then we've got the, the next section down is the reinforcement for that uh, architectural flare. And then the next section down is the actual core of the column. You can see the hoop confinement steel uh, and the main reinforcing bars. And then the bottom section is our pin. <laughs> um, here's the actual uh, response spectrum, acceleration response spectrum for the bridge. And then I've got plotted on here uh, the, the longitudinal and transverse demand. You can see it's up around 1G. So 1G, um, to be able to visualize that, is like building a building off the side of a cliff that's under 1g of load so if you're at 1g transverse load it's like having a, the bridge sitting off off the side of a cliff and and all the weight all its own weight forcing itself down so 1g is serious um, the objectives of the, the seismic analysis here were to show that um, and in any case is to show that local ductility it's for each of the columns exceeds three to show that global ductility of the bridge is limited to five, which is the limit in this case. To ensure that uh, the displacement capacity of the of the structure could withstand the the uh, the seismic displacement demand. Um, to design columns that possess adequate strength and ductility to resist that demand, and to design capacity protected elements based on that overstrength moment that we talked about of uh, the plastic hinges. Um, in each column. Um, I used uh, the elastic dynamic analysis or response spectrum analysis to determine demand, and I used the inelastic static analysis um, or the pushover analysis to determine capacity. Um, I modeled it, I, I created two models, one for each, so they had slightly different, used slightly different boundary conditions for each one. Um, and they're both based on the stage construction model, which I, I used, which I developed in MIDAS. Um, you know, I've used uh, I used Larsa for um, for the Panama Bridge, and I've used Midas here for this. And there's uh, a lot of similarities, some some differences. For those of you that have used both, you you understand this. Um, I don't think either one of them is, is better than the other. Um, they have they have different strengths and weaknesses. But uh, I could say that the stage construction analysis uh, component of uh, Midas Civil. Uh, was was very well done and, and, and very helpful and provided uh, a clear picture of, of what I was dealing with here and easy to use. Um, so there's your plug. Here's uh, here's uh, some some screenshots from from the Midas models. Um, got the uh, response spectral analysis um, to determine longitudinal and, and transverse displacement demand. You can see these columns typical in, in modeling, if, if you're new to this, is your substructure, you want to have at least three elements comprising your substructure. So you can see here there's one, two, three, and that's uh, that's the, the best way to get accurate results from, from those elements. 
more is better, but it's gonna it's gonna cost in um, in production time and uh, in time to to run the model, and you're gonna have more post production values to sift through. Um, and then in the superstructure, you want to have at least four elements, but um, it depends, I guess, on everything that you're trying to accomplish in the superstructure model. You may end up with more than that. I ended up with more than that just to be able to place various elements where I needed them to be. Um, so inelasticity here was simulated by reducing member stiffnesses that were expected to behave non-linearly, non namely the columns. Effective stiffnesses were derived from the moment curvature analyses of the earthquake resisting elements under iterative axial load. Um, and then the, the iteration uh, the iteration can be performed in just simple spreadsheets. And then you know, you're running your model, you're, you're outputting results in the spreadsheet, providing you with uh, more um, values to determine convergence. And then you're going, you know, you're taking those values, putting them back in, and it's a cycle until you get convergence, but easily done in Excel. Um, Multilinear force displacement functions. This is the difference between the two of the capacity and the demand um, boundary conditions here. But I use multilinear force displacement functions applied at the abutment uh, bearing uh, girder ends that simulated the passive solar resistance. And you're only going to get one abutment uh, activated at a time, it's pushing back against one abutment while it's leaving the other one, pushing back against the other while it's leaving this one. Um, so that needs to be considered. And then, uh, so you're not over uh, over assuming your stiffnesses derived from the abutments. And then I also applied uh, functions at the bent footings to simulate the foundation flexibility. And then here's uh, what the pushover analysis looks like. You can see this is at uh, what it looks like at first yield. So here's my longitudinal pushover. Looks like your basic first mode, um, and then transverse pushover. Uh, and the little blue dots are where the plastic hinge has formed or when that particular column has yielded, that particular element has yielded. Um, and then you just continue to push that until you get, uh, until you get failure, um, so you understand what your overall capacity is. So that's it. Um, I think we have time for some questions. Uh, so Mr. Midas, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hansener. So for all attendees, if you have any questions related to the webinar, you can input your question in the question chat box and I will collect them and share it on my screen for Mr. Kyle Turner to answer. If the question is not answered due to the time limit, I will send the question to Kyle Turner and those answers will be posted on the review page. Thank you. And also I saw someone like ask how to download the presentation material. So this webinar session is recorded. So each attendee will, will receive the follow-up email includes the review page. On the review page, you will find the recording of the webinar and also the presentation file there. Okay. So I have two questions here. Let me show it on my screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see it, Mr. Turner? No. Do I need to turn this back over to you? Oh, here we go. I see it now. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Sorry. For a transverse case, how do we ensure that the plastic hinge occurs during compression? For example, if the bent has two columns at around the edge of the deck, one column undergoes compression and another goes into tension. So to ensure that the plastic hinge occurs on the compression column, is it okay for the plastic hinge to occur on the tension column? So one thing I'll say is you're right in assuming that, you know, as you push something transversely, a, a frame, one's gonna go, one side of the frame is gonna go into compression and one side is gonna go into tension. Um, if you're in the tension column or compression column, you're still gonna be transversely bending. And consider that an earthquake doesn't just go in one direction. You're gonna be going in both directions. So it's a cyclic thing. Um, both columns will experience an equal amount depending on the, the, their geometric location within the bridge and the uh, tributary load that they're asked to uh, resist. They're going to experience basically an equal amount of cycles and an equal amount of uh, tension and, and compression. And once that plastic hinge forms, it doesn't matter if it's the tension or the comp compression um, side, 
it's going to form under the, the governing limit state. Uh, can you quickly go through the various sections on slide 17? Um, so I went through these. Maybe you could, um, here, I'm going to pull my screen back up. Maybe you could uh, ask in, in more detail what, what you want to know about these sections, if this is what you're talking about. This is the, you know, the top section down to the bottom. This is our isolated flare. This is the flare that reinforcement. This is just the, the main column, uh, the structural component of the column, and this is the pin. How was failure defined in the model? Um, it's defined through the um, material properties of the uh, of the column that are established in the column. So there's multiple ways that it can fail, um, and you're going to have different limit states. Um, but your your column has so much capacity based on the moment curvature analysis, uh, the effective material properties, effective section properties and um, in the plastic hinge definition. Um, what is your typical role? Hi, Mr. Turner. Well, construction Can you hear me? Support for okay. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I think I think the internet when it goes off. Can you so, repeat the question and answer sure. it again? Thank you so much. What is your What is your typical role in construction support for a bridge you have designed? Typically, the contractor is going to be going over the design, submitting RFIs, requests for information, and I'm answering those RFIs. They're going to be submitting um, their their plans materials and sections for the design for instance uh here's my concrete mix all the chemical properties i'm analyzing that concrete mix based on standards and determining whether or not the, that concrete is good for use they're submitting uh you know post tensioning uh drawings and calculations camber calculations uh precast girder uh drawings and calculations to, and uh, shop drawings for all that stuff and I'm analyzing it and making sure and comparing it to the design and making sure that the spirit of the design is carried out in those uh, drawings and, ca and calculations and uh, trying to ensure the accuracy of any calculations um, and then providing feedback and it's a little back and forth usually and then once construction starts um, they're going to run into other challenges and, and uh, I'm there to help uh, uh, overcome those challenges or provide options for solutions and working with them as, as part of a team. Um, and then observing uh, critical components of construction, um, stressing strands, pouring concrete, um, excavating, shoring, uh, stuff like that. Page seven, any particular reason to do directional combination by CQC3 method? Yes, because um, we're analyzing um, a longitudinal earthquake and a transverse earthquake. We don't know what direction that earthquake is going to hit. It's going to shake all over the place. So we're taking our analyzed longitudinal and transverse orthogonal directions and combining them to try to estimate what our max displacement is going to be as a result of those two directional earthquakes. And it's not always just two. Um, it depends on the category of the bridge, uh, which we discussed to begin with, and the performance level of that bridge has to meet. Sometimes it's up to six different earthquakes you're applying at a, at a single support and trying to uh, combine them in ways that make sense. Um, and then even across a single bridge, um, depending on the length of the bridge, each support might have different response spectrums or different time histories. Um, so you're different earthquakes at different supports within the same bridge. Um, in plan, the bridge is skewed. Is it also skewed in the model during analysis? Yes. Um, you, uh, before I, I started really 
working in bridge engineering very much, I didn't understand the complexity of SKU. Um, I didn't get what's the big deal, <laughs> but turns out it's kind of a big deal and SKU uh, really alters your demand and the ability for of your uh, of your components to resist that demand and it'd be great if it, everything worked and across it you know the section that you wanted to but it's 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 working in all directions um, and we have to to consider that so yes my model definitely considered it have you ever had a project in which the displacement demand was large enough to trigger the need to consider the effects of p delta if so how did you deal with it yes um, and then I considered the effects of P delta. So there's code requirements and, and formulas that you can use to determine uh, the impact of P delta and uh, and the requirements and formulas to help you understand if you need to consider P delta. So if you need to consider it, there's there's a methodology within ASHO that can help you um, perform those calculations. Don't you think having long dowels at the end will make difficulty for girder construction? Since it will need holes in the pre-stressing abutment, um, I think you're asking about dowels at the at the girder ends, at the at the bent connection and the abutment connection. So yes, the there have to be holes that are cast into into the girders during during pre-casting, and that's commonly done. And those holes have to be big enough to accommodate the dowel and also to accommodate uh, the high strength grout that goes in there to uh, support the dowel. Uh, but doweling is, is very common to be able to connect the, the girders to the um, uh, to the diaphragms at the abutment and the bend. So it's it's uh, it's 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 a good method. It's tried and true. Uh, for someone getting started on modeling seismic behavior in Midas, how do you suggest they get started? Um, just do it. <laughs> Midas has got one thing I'll say about Midas that's really impressed me is um, the speed at which I get my questions answered. So uh, I had lots of questions. Um, this is my first bridge I designed using Midas, and uh, they basically assigned a team to me. That's what I felt like, and you just go on their 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 portal, and uh, you have an account, and, and you input your question. And first, you can search all the other questions that have been that have been asked and see if that question has already been answered. They've got a good help manual also that you can use to try and figure it out. Last ditch though, you can't figure it out. Anyone else that you know that's used Midas can't figure it out. You can ask Midas and they will get back to you really fast. And I had engineers assigned to, to work with me throughout this project from Midas that helped me um, with every question that I had really quickly, especially if it was urgent and I needed to know right now, um, which is often the case, uh, Midas was fantastic in providing that support. Um, so I suggest you just do it. Um, start modeling. Uh, get yourself that book that that, uh, that I recommended, and uh, understand some basic seismic modeling techniques. Develop your model and try to use the analysis techniques uh, and modules in Midas. Um, start small and run into problems and figure out how to fix them, um, and then you learn. So it's a learning experience every time, and as I think uh, one consistent. Um, aspect of my career has been I seem to always be doing things that I don't already know how to do it's rare that I'm doing something that I already know how to do I feel like every time it's just stressed or you know I don't know how to do this how am I going to figure it out and it's just this mountain that I feel like I have to climb every time um, and then you climb it and move on to the next one so just do it All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Carlsoner. I really appreciated your presentation. And for all attendees, thanks for joining our webinar session. So Carlsoner is our expert engineer from Microsoft Expert Network. It's a network platform for engineers to learn from experts' experience and insights. So we have more than 60 expert engineers. If you're interested to speak to Kyle Turner or other experts, so you can join our Microsoft Expert Network. And again, so this webinar session is recorded. Each attendee will receive the follow-up email, includes the review page. And on the review page, you won't find the recording of the webinar and the presentation file there. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good day.